Hi everyone, welcome to They Did What? Oh, they they did what? Yeah, they did they did what? Oh, they did the what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rhiannon. I'm Mitch. And today we're kind of talking about something in history. It's not like one little event. We're not doing one person or one yes. day. Yes. We're talking about a herb uh, and the way it was used in the ancient world and then the modern views of that herb. Oh, okay. So, yeah, a bit different. So this herb was called, is called, still, Silphium. Oh, good, because the way you were sort of dancing around, it's a herb, how <laughs> we think about it today, how we thought about it back then, I was like, are we doing a pot episode? <laughs> I was not told about this. <laughs> oh, man, every time I teach and some kids are like, marijuana. I'm like, no, we're in the ancient Mediterranean, guys. Calm down. <laughs> Wasn't there. No. Opium. <laughs> Opium, though. <laughs> Which, that's a whole episode in itself. Oh, that's an episode in itself, just the early cultivation, mm -hmm. let alone the misuse. Oh, and then the goddess of opium. Oh. So many fascinating things about opium. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about something just as interesting, to be yes. completely honest. <laughs> so, Silphium uh, is apparently not a Greek name. It is apparently the name that the local people of the area it came from called it. Okay. So Silphium grew naturally in what is modern day Libya. Okay. But in ancient times it was called Cyrene. So it's so it's a Greek sounding name, but it's <laughs> technically North African in origin. Mm. Okay. That's gonna really confuse me as we go forward. <laughs> um, and it does have another name, so the Romans would call the sap of this herb laser. Okay. Um, I'm sure Estelle yeah. really enjoys that name. Estelle. Estelle, Estelle Laser. Laser. <laughs> <laughs> and listeners are like, who? Sorry guys, uh, she is a very, very important archaeologist, uh, very involved in Pompeii and Herculaneum. And so would know the mm. Roman name for the yes. sap. <laughs> and if you have studied Pompeii and Herculaneum in year 11, 12 in Australia, you would have read the textbook written by her. Yes. We have worked with her mm. once or twice. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so... This ancient herb is was oh my gosh, is was is was is and was. <clears throat> Pick up. <laughs> this ancient herb was prized by the Greeks and Romans and is believed to have gone extinct because of how much they loved it and how much they used it. That doesn't sound like humans at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not like there was once a whole other species of elephant or a whole other species of lion. No, they just. <laughs> or whole other species of human. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Multiple of those. Uh, so ancient Cyrene was settled by the Greeks and then annexed by the Romans in 74 BCE. Okay. So not super ancient. No. 2000 years. But that's just getting into the Roman Empire. Yeah. But or the Republic. Yeah. We're at the end of okay. the Republic when the Romans take over. Uh, and... The silphium that was growing in the area made the city of Cyrene uh, the richest in Af Africa. According to the sources I read. Okay. <laughs> I think that would be rich in Africa connected to the Mediterranean. Maybe. Like, I, th I think that's a big claim. I, I still think there'd be some, like, Egyptian arguments at certain points. Mm. But if we're looking at just that time period, that's a possibility. Yeah. yeah, and it, like, it was so important to Cyrene that they had an image of the plant on their coin. Okay. That's a big deal. Yeah. That's a very big deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, because they had a monopoly on the trade of the plant. Like, you couldn't... Oh, uh, okay. You couldn't farm it. Oh. Yes. Which is a very fascinating thing about this herb. Uh, so that means, you know, they can't go and grow it somewhere else. They tried. <laughs> Here? Nowhere else. Yes. Oh, boy. No, no bad. Uh, and it was, you know, so great, apparently, that Julius Caesar stored a cache of it in the treasury... And that cash was 680 kilograms worth. Okay. Which, I don't know how he's... He must be drying it. Like, you're obviously not <laughs> storing fresh. <laughs> Just going into the treasury. It smells a bit dank in here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Caesar, what have you done with the currency? <laughs> <laughs> so, Silphium was used for medicine. It was used as a perfume. Okay. It was used for food as a seasoning. And also, apparently, people would just, like, fry up the roots of it in some, like, oil, eat it like that. Yummy, great I'm stuff. He I'm hearing hemp. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the one that everyone talks about today is that it was used as an aphrodisiac. 
Okay, now I'm starting to understand how the Greeks and Romans might have made it extinct. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So one of the medicinal uses was to induce abortions and as a birth control. Okay. That's not usually an aphrodisiac side effect (laughs) or effect, though. Well, yep. But that is the one that a lot of people talk about, is that it was able to induce abortions. Because apparently if you took it, it would bring on menses. Ah, oh. Mm. So either way, it's going to act as a birth control or get rid of anything that's in there. Jeez. Mm. This is... I'm waiting for the, like, really long, um, you know, do not take this product. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So Hippocrates said it could be used as a poultice or to soothe the stomach. That was one of the other medicinal Mm -hmm. uses. It's one of those things that was a cure-all at the time. Clearly. Fevers, Mm. stomach aches, coughs, everything. Um, But that medicinal aspect has been played up since ancient times. Okay. Very much so. Because a lot of the classical Greek texts don't talk about it in the medicinal sense. They don't talk about it in the aphrodisiac or in the birth control sense. Oh. They talk about it in food. Okay. It's all in culinary context. Huh. Like, you're making this dish, sylphium. Add some sylphium, do this, put some sylphium inside. Um, and there's a man who has perpetrated a lot of the myths around sylphium called John Riddle, uh, who wrote a whole book on contraception and abortion from the ancient world to the Renaissance. And a second book, Eve's Herbs, A History of Contraception and Abortion in the West. It's always a good idea to have a man (laughs) (laughs) as the primary author of books about that. Yes. Um, And he makes a lot of unsubstantiated claims. Really? Mm. Oh, who would have guessed? But people have just taken him at his word. Oh, no. Especially in regards to sylphium. Um, So according to him, the ancient physician Saronis suggested taking a monthly dose of sylphium the size of a chickpea to prevent pregnancy and destroy the existing. That is a horrifying expression. Mm. To destroy the existing. <laughs> Just, that's that's a level of sinister. <laughs> yep. Uh, so the belief that it's, it's extinct uh, is partially because by Pliny's time, mm. so Pliny the Elder, right, okay. um, the one who wrote down most of the stuff. <laughs> Pliny the Younger really just wrote down the eruption of Pompeii. Yeah. But I mean, it's not like Pliny the Elder could have. <laughs> Awkward. For uh, those who don't know, it's because he died during the eruption. Of... Yes, and that's why Pliny the Younger wrote his account. Yes. Look how great my uncle was. Mm. <laughs> ah, yes, bias. Mm. Uh, so by Pliny's time, the herb was already building mythology. And oh, he's one of the wow. ones who wrote about it as this amazing cure-all. And this is like... 200 years later. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, so Pliny also wrote down that someone had found one one little piece left of Silphium in his time period. Oh. And it was given to Emperor Nero. Okay. As a delicacy of like, <laughs> look, we have found this single stalk. Mm. And then the Emperor Nero ate it. Of course. Which some modern people have been like, see, obviously didn't know all the great uses for it. It's like, or... The only thing that they actually used it for was... (laughs) He was fully aware of what it was great for, which was eating. That's a lot of stuff that people claim Nero had no idea what he was doing. If you look at it historically, it's like, oh no, man man knew what was going on. (laughs) (laughs) We have one stock of Silvium, mine. Mm, Exactly, he's the emperor. Yeah. So the idea that it's extinct, mm. uh, people have talked about why is it extinct. Right. So one is the idea that it was harvested to extinction. Okay. Because, you know, there was such demand for it, they couldn't keep up. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, especially because they may have messed with the soil. Okay. Which then it couldn't regrow. Uh, desertification of the area is also pointed to. Okay. Uh, but others believe it's not actually extinct. Oh, we just know it as something else? Yeah. That uh, it's hiding in plain sight as a weed. In the area. Oh. Because... That would be yeah. really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> like, no one's just... No historian's gone with one of their coins, just, like, comparing it to... Well, they have. Flo- oh, they have? Okay. <laughs> there has been some stuff done. So, it's believed to be a variety of giant fennel. Okay. And there are a couple of fennels in the region, still, today. Mm-hmm. Uh, that potentially could be sylphium. Yeah. So, there haven't been enough... Uh, studies done on the native plants of Libya okay. to be 100% certain that it is extinct. Right. Now, with the fact that it was harvested from the wild, mm. they did try to farm it. 
It okay. just believed it needed very specific soil requirements. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And it's to do with the way the, the plant germinates. So okay. it's like huckleberries. People can't oh, farm okay, huckleberries. Right. Yeah. Um, which is quite fascinating. <laughs> yeah. That there Always are confusing just, that mm. there are plants that just will not let us farm them. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I like this crevice between two rocks. Thank you very much. I will not have your well fertilized soil. Good mm. day, sir. <laughs> uh, so there was obviously a black market for the herb at the time. Of course. Which is probably also why it was over farmed because they were trying to be like, nope, we only take this much at a time because it we doesn't need it grow to well. Grow back, yeah. uh, so that in the black market, it would often be cut with other herbs. <laughs> Are you alright? Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely not so. <laughs> like, if it is a spice of a food, it's very much going to be that, hey, hey, do, do you spice? <laughs> you spice? <laughs> it's just, it is crazy, isn't it? Like, this herb, everyone's like... Let me like... cut this fennel <laughs> with other herbs. Was so one of the herbs oh. it was cut with, or replaced outright with, uh, was asafoetida. Okay. Which you can still get today. It's a good onion replacement. Oh, okay. Um, like, yeah, a lot of people use it uh, in... So, people with intolerances will use it. And then it's like also... Us. Yeah. <laughs> both of us have an onion intolerance. Um, but it's also used a lot in Ayurvedic cooking. Oh, okay. Because if you have a pitta imbalance or you're pitta heavy, mm. uh, which is fiery, then they recommend not having garlic and onion. Yeah. So that's a very good replacement herb for that reason. Yeah. Which does give us some sense of maybe what this tasted like. Yeah. Um, so it's also making me think it's going to be really disappointing for us with a modern palate mm. when we finally figure it out. That was some of the things I read, is that, like, it probably wouldn't have been that tasty to us today. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is the ancient Romans. They put garum on everything. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Which, garum, everybody, it's a fish sauce made from, like, old fermented fish. Yeah. And they put it on everything. Yeah. And like part of Roman cooking was mixing bitter with sweet. Yeah. It was weird flavor combos that we would not do today. No. no. So, you know, this herb might not be as yeah, tasty as <laughs> they thought it was. Um one of the other things I read, it was regularly mixed with rubber or ground beans, uh even black pepper or cheap mustard from Alexandria. Oh, okay, yeah. Um was mixed in to oh. make the herb last longer. And even juniper berries. Okay. Which I guess if you've never tasted the silphium and someone gives it to you, it's like it's like those teenagers who get given like dried herbs <laughs> instead of weed. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey guys, I bought something. It smells like oregano, but you promised me it's not. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Um and so Pliny the Elder wrote that Roman landlords had been trying to fence off the herbs meadow habitat. Oh, okay. Um in order to stop like the sheep from eating it, which was another issue. Uh, and one of the later writings as well. <laughs> Most expensive sheep in the flock. Well, that's, that was one of the other things people wrote later, yeah. is that like animals that had eaten this herb had better meat, like Wagyu today. Oh God. It's like- I think that's just the guy massaging it to try and get it to throw it back up <laughs> and accidentally creating Wagyu yeah. lamb. Yeah, it's just like the amount of mythology that has been built around this herb Fantastic. is insane. Um, yeah. So, as I said, it probably, it likely isn't extinct. Okay. And it wasn't fully extinct by the time of Pliny. All right. Um, because in his natural histories, he says, so Laserpitium, that's the full mm -hmm. Roman name, uh, a very remarkable plant known to the Greeks by the name of Silphian, uh, originally a native of the province of Serenicea. The juice of the plant is called laser, greatly in vogue for medicinal as well as other purposes. Note that he does not mention birth yeah. control. Um, <clears throat> being sold at the same rate as silver. Oh boy. Yeah. For these many years past, however, it has not been found is in Cyrenicea, as the farmers of the revenue who hold the land there on lease have a notion that it is more profitable to depasture flocks of sheep upon them. Huh. Hmm. Okay. So, interesting. Yeah. Uh, within the memory of the present generation, a single stalk is all that have been found. And that's the piece that went to yeah. Nero. Uh, for this long time past, there has been no other laser imported into this country, but that produced in either Persis, Medea, or Armenia. 
where it grows in considerable abundance, though much inferior to that of Cyrenaceae. And even then, it is extensively adulterated with gum, sarcopenium, or pounded beans. Jeez. So that feeds into why a lot of people think it is a type of fennel. Okay. Yeah. And he's talking about other fennels that are growing in those regions. Uh, that and they don't taste as good. Yeah. 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 So fascinating idea that it probably does still exist. And it is just a little weed. Um, there are also doctors continuing to prescribe it after Pliny had written that. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Spencer Alexander McDaniel wrote this in Tales of Time Forgotten. For instance, the Greek medicinal writer Serranus of Ephesus, uh, so that's in 98 to 138 CE, okay. recommends in his book on gynecology that a woman seeking to induce menstruation should drink huh. um, a balm with sylphium in it. And Theophratus described the plant... Oh, that's... <laughs> I'm just going to come back to that. Um, and then in the 3rd century CE, a female doctor named mm. Metra Dora uh, had a recipe for an abortifacient, so yep. abortion, uh, which talks about sylphium as well. Mm. So one thing I want to say about that abortion aspect, so yeah. that man I was talking about earlier who wrote the two books apparently did some studies on modern fennel in rats and found it had like a very high efficiency for inducing abortion. Oh, boy. It's like, okay, we're not rats, eh? <laughs> yeah. B, there really isn't enough evidence from when it's most famous that that was that its that purpose. What, yeah. yeah. Um, it's like mugwort. So mugwort is talked oh, about today yeah. as being able to bring on menses. Yeah. It's not that effective. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to think that, you know, they had this amazing medicine, but a lot of it is probably, you know, Christian propaganda coming on yes. later about the Romans yeah. and sex because it's like oh my gosh they were so obsessed with sex that they ate this plant to extinction in order to just have lots of sex yeah. without getting pregnant um, you know it's all that idea that the Romans were having lots and lots of orgies yeah well. when you know we really don't have so much evidence of that guys like probably happened but not as much as the Christians wanted to say <laughs> probably not as much as the Christians were having <laughs> Let's put a whole bunch of repressed, <laughs> sexually repressed people in a building and not let them go outside. <laughs> They'll find God one way or the other. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so one of the other things about Silphium is it has been connected to the heart symbol. Oh, okay. So this is the herb. So if you look at images of Silphium on the coins, there's the one that looks like a giant fennel. Mm. And then there's other coins that have like a heart on the back. Okay. It looks very similar to a heart, at least. Um, and it's the seed pod of the sylphium. Oh, so in the same way we can link, like, um, poppy bulb in the design of certain mm. medicinal jars and vials from the ancient yeah. world, we can link that sort of symbology to sylphium. Yeah. That's cool. It is. And it is probably also partially why the medicinal aspects of sylphium got so played up. Oh, so it's like, yeah. oh, but it's a heart, and hearts are associated with love, and they're using it for sex, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like sort of medieval Christian scholars trying <laughs> to understand the ancient world. Yes. Um, so yeah, overall, sylphium, probably most used for eating, for mm. flavouring foods, um, and not so much for medicinal purposes. That's intense. Mm. And that's all I have to say on Silphium. Yeah. Well, we've scuttled that mythology. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of, no, it's just a flavour. Yes. Move on. <laughs> it may have been used, yeah, as medicinal things, but whether it actually had the powers that were attributed to it. Or, or the possibility that it was a Mary Poppins kind of addition to make medicine more palatable going down. Mm. It is found on the um, temples of Asclepius nearby to Sari. Oh, okay. So, you know, there is something about it. Yeah. But, I mean, people take garlic and horseradish today for colds. Yeah. It, it does help, but it's not... <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not medicine medicine. Yeah, that's... it's not some magic cure-all. <laughs> yeah, um, because yeah, stuff that we realised worked like medicine, we took and turned it into medicine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Ah. So, yeah, that's it for today, guys. All right, um, and I guess we'll, uh, we'll hear from you next time, mm. and we'll... Uh, 
talk about something else. <laughs> something else. Bye. <laughs> Bye. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today.